Well, welcome everybody uh, to the next installment in the small business management series. I'm Nathan Owens from UCSD Extension. And today's webinar is going to be on the five stages of design thinking and entrepreneurship, which is a pretty exciting topic. It's one I've been fortunate, to, fortunate enough to get exposed to over the years and find it to be a very powerful uh, approach uh, and mindset when looking at trying to come up with new ideas that might be beneficial to you, to your customers, to society, to, to whomever. So uh, as we get into this, just wanted to let everybody know that uh, we're gonna be recording today. And the idea is that after about a week or so, uh, when, when, when we touch this up a little bit, uh, we're going to post this to UC San Diego Extension's YouTube channel. And so it'll be available to everybody to take a look at that in case they want to refer back to, to something that they heard. So because we're recording, we want to make sure that we're not capturing your video or, or audio. So I'll just keep that in, in mind. Uh, so today's speaker is somebody I've known for nearly 20 years, worked pretty closely with him uh, for a good part of that. Uh, Greg Forlitt, who is the director of Innovation Design at UC San Diego's Office of Innovation and Commercialization. Uh, um, he'll tell you maybe a little bit more about himself, but besides that role, he's also a serial entrepreneur and an investor, and he is also an instructor for a class of which design thinking is a component of, and that class is called the Essentials of Entrepreneurship and Innovation, and I can Give you a little bit more uh, info on that uh, by a link in, in chat here in a bit uh, and then also in a follow-up email with also Greg's slide deck uh, which I'll send out to everybody afterwards. Just want to let everyone know that we're going to do a chat or sorry Q&A via chat today so if you do have anything that you want to uh, ask about or get clarification on feel free to drop that in chat and either Greg or I will then bring that up and, and, and address it when we can. All right, uh, if you're not familiar with UC San Diego Extension, just very quickly, we are the professional and continuing education arm of UC San Diego. We're there for providing opportunities for personal growth, career development, uh, helping uh, uh, with community outreach and engagement, and essentially trying to help everybody be their best selves. So if you have an interest in getting a new skill or improving one that you currently have, we have over 4,000 courses. So it covers a huge range of things. And you can see the link to our website down there in the bottom left corner, uh, extension.ucsd.edu. For this webinar series, which I've been doing for three years now, I have a couple of partners. These are co-working spaces located in downtown San Diego, Downtown Works and Cross Campus. And they have been fantastic over the years. Hopefully when we're able to start doing things in person again, uh, I can start holding those sessions back at their location, which were fantastic. So if you are looking at a co-working space and happen to be in San Diego, those are worth checking out. As for future topics in the series, uh, well, I've got some that I'm uh, trying to put together starting in 2021. So those will get posted on the Small Business Management Series webpage soon. And then a parallel series that some of my colleagues at Extension are doing uh, on leadership and management essentials. The next one is gonna be on December 2nd, uh, leveraging creativity to increase leadership impact. So hopefully if you haven't already signed up for that uh, and have an interest in it, you can take a look. I'll post the link uh, for that in chat here in a minute too. For the small business management series, this is where you can go to find out more about what topics we're covering in the webinar series, or if you wanna explore other things, you can take a look at that. Lastly, I try to make this series as relevant and useful to you uh, who are either running a small business or working for a small business. And I have been fortunate enough to source nearly all of these topics from people such as yourself. So if you do have something that you're struggling with or wanna find out more information on, feel free to send me an email and let me know because we have over a thousand instructors, people like Greg, who are subject matter experts uh, practitioners in their fields, and there's a pretty good chance that I can find that subject matter expert to put a session together. So feel free to shoot me an email if you want, and I will see what I can do about making that happen. All right, with that, I will stop talking and turn things over to Greg.
So a uh, few things. Uh, first, I'll tell you a little bit uh, about myself, um, that I'm a serial entrepreneur, um, investor, author. I now have the wonderful uh, opportunity to be part of the Office of Innovation and Commercialization as the Director of Innovation Design. Um, so it kind of brings my cycle completely back around and I am what you would call a pracademic. It's a, a it's someone who kind of works within a university environment, but we are full practitioners. We're people who uh, uh, have built companies, have funded companies, have grown companies, who have advised companies. And so I'm going to give you a bit of that kind of perspective as what it's like to be um, someone who actually runs and exits companies and now invests in them. Uh, so part of my one of the hats I wear is I am a venture capitalist. I do invest in startup companies. So a lot of what you're going to be hearing is, is based on uh, both experience and kind of what we've learned by talking to people who do this uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, today, we're going to give you a bit of a teaser uh, for some of the stuff that we do in our class. So we have a class, as uh, uh, Nathan mentioned, called Essentials of Innovation and Entrepreneurship. But what we wanted to do that was slightly different than traditional entrepreneurship programs is that those focus just specifically on the skills necessary to start a company. But what we realize is that entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship is a kind of a different breed. It, it, uh, it requires you to have a certain mindset and behavior set that is quite a bit different because so often you're going to um, conditions that are highly ambiguous and uncertain and volatile and complex. And you're trying to figure things out in real time while all the world's changing around you. And so our class teaches you the skills that kind of upgrade your human operating system to go along with then all this technical knowledge you're learning about how to write business plans and how to pitch opportunities and how to create business models. So we're gonna give you a teaser uh, of not only the first module, which is around design thinking, which is kind of getting inside your head and how to organize all those noisy thoughts you have, but a bit also about business modeling we're going to talk about, which is kind of once you organize the noise in your head, how do you then take it and put it into a format that you can actually act upon? So with that said, we're going to kind of uh, uh, move through it. And for those of you who have not been exposed to this concept of design thinking, uh, it became popular starting in the um, early 2000s and really kind of took hold around uh, 2005 and six at Stanford University, where I have the pleasure of lecturing as part of the Center for Design Research on exactly this topic, but as it applies to startups and startup ecosystems. And the first time I met with the folks at the Stanford D School, as it is called, I asked them, so what exactly is design thinking? And here you see one definition of it, uh, which is that it's a human-centered approach to innovation, and it basically pulls from a lot of different perspectives. You know, what are the needs and dreams of people? What possibilities do the technic, uh, technologies have to match that? And then what are the requirements uh, in business? But the person I spoke to explained it quite differently. He said, you know, well, design thinking is really about teaching empathy. And I said, well, who do you teach this empathy to? And he says, oh, we teach it to bad people. And that kind of put me aback. And I said, well, who do you consider to be a bad person? He says, well, you're a bad person. And when I asked him why he thought that I was a bad person, he says, because as an entrepreneur, you go out in the world and you change things without permission. And I said, why is that inherently bad? And he said, because so often we take our view of the world and we smother the rest of the world with our ideas and perspectives. And he said, but imagine how much better that approach would be if instead of just looking through your eyes, you could actually look through the eyes of the people who you're creating this for, because almost all innovation is for other people. You're creating products and services and you're changing organizational models and the world so that people can live better lives and more productive lives and more prosperous lives. And if you're doing that, then you really have to be able to inhabit their souls and their perspectives in order to do that. And that was a big shift for me which is what made me a big devotee and uh, uh, someone who wanted to then study and dig deeper into this concept of design thinking. And as we said, design thinking is really about this approach of empathy and being able to teach empathy to others, which is something that I personally find is lacking not only in what our society is embracing in general, but actually the way we teach in school. 
And just think, as I said, how much better life would be is if we could truly inhabit and look through other people's eyes. And so the four principles of design thinking that start off is the one that design thinking and innovation is a social activity. We even say it's a body contact sport. You can't make it happen without going and talking to people and bumping into one another. You know, Matt Ridley, who wrote The Rational Optimist, even says innovation is all about ideas having sex. It's about the collision, the serendipitous interaction of ideas, and it's combining and recombining and tearing things apart. And so by nature, it's a social exercise. So we one of the first rules we tell entrepreneurs is never go hunting alone. Go with other people. Uh, two is that ambiguity is important because ambiguity is inevitable. One, it's because only when things are unclear and uncertain do we get up out of our chairs and we look for answers or we explore new things. When we're very content about the way things are or things are incredibly clear to us, we tend not to feel that we have to get up. We tend to then just react. And most of that reaction is passive. And of course, all design is redesign. People have said all invention is reinvention. And while technology and social circumstances may change, our basic human needs do not. We still have similar desires and hopefully similar needs. And the tangibility rule of design thinking is we create prototypes and artifacts because when we can put something in our hands and react off of it and look in someone's eyes and react off of their expressions, that's so much better than us just intellectualizing of what may or may not happen. And so these are all the principles that then get embedded of that. Now, as we now shift this over to how this relates to entrepreneurs in, in particular, we say there's three essential traits that we've observed of all high impact entrepreneurs. If you master these possibilities, then, then truly anything uh, can really happen for you. The first, uh, Intellectual curiosity. I've never met a great entrepreneur who is not just naturally curious. Because if you're not curious, then you never ask questions and you never kind of search anything. You just assume the world is the way it is and you become a consumer of the world, but never a creator within the world. And so curiosity leads you in interesting places. I wonder why, I wonder how, I wonder if. And exploring those things really kind of leads you into the really important thing. Now, the second trait is you learn how to ask questions. And the more questions you ask, the better you become at asking questions. And one of the ways you get asking a good questions is by asking really bad questions. And so we encourage this over and over and over again for people to ask questions and lots of them. Um, and the third, is learning how to be a good listener. Is if you can be a good listener, uh, then the world is opportunity. And that doesn't mean just uh, uh, listening to people, but actually hearing them. Because very often the most important things that people will tell you happen between the words and between the meaning of what they're trying to do. And so learning that really uh, good quality, what we call active listening is really important because most people only listen just to respond. That as someone begins talking, you're immediately thinking of what is the next thing I have to say to them. So truly learn how to take a deep breath when people are talking, try to say, what are they trying to tell me? What is their intention? Uh, and it will lead you in new places because if you only build what people are exactly telling you, as Henry Ford is supposedly have said in an apocryphal quote, is if I gave people truly what they wanted, it would be a faster horse. So very often the key to changing, particularly transformational uh, technology or transformational ideas is to listen between the words. And that's where design thinking can be very, very helpful. And it's a circular process of trying to really understand the world and understand a problem or an opportunity and then exploring it and developing it. But then more importantly, having that all come back in um, and around. Now, while we're doing this, I'll see, um, we will be sharing the slides and we will be posting these uh, things. So I'm also watching the chat at the same time. Um, so it is this kind of circular process that you will explore. And we give you in the class many opportunities to explore this. We push you into this kind of journey uh, that you want to do. 
but you never again do it alone. And we always will. We may take you out of your comfort zone. We'll always keep you in your safety zone. So thinking, design thinking is actually at the heart of, of innovation because it's where that kind of analytical thinking where you deconstruct things and your intuitive thinking kind of come together. And another way of saying that is as much as we would love to believe the human beings are these intellectual and rational things, and that's the only thing that we really are, we're also very emotional and sentient. And when what we think aligns with what we feel, then we call that belief. It's when those two begin resonating and agree with one another. And that's also is part of the circuit that then allows us to go out in the world and actually do something. Because then we feel comfortable doing what we know or we think to be true. And that's where design thinking can truly come into uh, being. This is another way of looking at it. It's a bit of the mil bit more linear kind of process, which people love to embody. But of course, this all cycles back in around. So even when we do get to the end of the result, it comes back. And these are those five building blocks of design thinking. As we said, the first thing is to empathy, to connect at a very emotional and human level with either a problem or a situation or something we observe in the world. But then we have to define it. We have to give, we have to name it and give meaning to it. And then once we can do it, we can begin ideating it around it. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And then eventually we then, once we think we understand and can ideate around it, we take that ideation and do something with it in the form of a prototype, create an artifact that we can interact with. And the artifact doesn't necessarily have to be quote, merely a product. It could be a new business model. It could be a new process. It could be a new way. And once we deliver that to somebody else and we see how they play and interact with it, then that's the form of testing. And then once that test occurs, people then bring it back to us and say, this is what we like, this is what we didn't like, this is what worked for us, and this is what didn't work for us. And the whole cycle begins again. So the hey, first one is- Greg, real ahead. quick, uh, question from the chat. If you could uh, go back over that comfort zone versus safety zone, bit, real quick. Absolutely. So very often we like to conflate our comfort zones and safety zones together. We think that one of the ways we know that we're safe is by feeling totally comfortable, but that's not always the case because truly with innovation, but with most really interesting things in life is when we push our boundaries slightly, when we take ourselves out of the known world of what we truly know, because so much of our learning and the pedagogy of education has been around the equivalent of teaching us how to read maps. Here's a map and in other conversations I do, I show a map of the late 1400s. And what was interesting about that is around the edges of all those maps, they used to put a Latin inscription that said Hic Centriconus, which meant here be dragons. Um, and as a way of saying that all you really need to know in life is what we've already spelled out for you, is what we've already defined for you. And it all, as long as you can navigate the rules of what we've already given to you, you should be not only safe, but comfortable. But we also found that explorers, you know, the early innovators would often go off the edges of the map. They knew that there was something better and more important off the edges of the map. But the skills you really need to do that are not just map reading skills. You now know how to use, a, you now need to know how to use a compass, how to read the stars. And once you can inhabit these new kinds of skills, you take yourself beyond your comfort zones but still within your safety zones. And so it's more about the orienteering than just merely the navigation of something. And those are the skills we have to teach entrepreneurs. In these classes that we teach, we also teach entrepreneurs how to lean into uncertainty and ambiguity rather than shy away from it because we don't know. We teach people how to avoid being overwhelmed by a lot of the uncertainty. How do you kind of calm your brain and what we call amygdala hijacks. You know, it's that reptilian part of your brain, which is the flight or fight response, that when you get overwhelmed, you tend to kind of shut down. So uh, there's a lot of human operating system skills that then will align with your technical operating skills, this kind of stuff that we're teaching you right now. And the combination of those two will make you, those people who want to be more entrepreneurial, it would improve their skill set, and people who are already good entrepreneurs, it will make them even better. Fitness. Uh, hopefully that answered the question. Uh, Nathan, and jump in if uh, there are more questions.
So the first part of this journey in design thinking is around empathizing with it, because in order to truly make some innovations and all innovation is human centric, technology in and of itself has no meaning until human beings do something with it. And we give meaning to things. Um, and so we need to know our users and we need to care about their lives. And one aspect of design thinking is what's called needs finding. The other aspect of design thinking is what we call dream catching. And we'll define you know, what those two are a little bit uh, uh, more as we go along. So we connect at a very human level. Now, framing the right problem is the only way to create the right solution. So we have to define it in a way. We have to kind of really understand what it is. We have to have conversations by saying, now when you say X, I'm assuming or I'm interpreting that to mean you mean this. And someone says, no, that's not it. I really mean something else. Or they say, yes, that's exactly. So it's a lot of interchange. And when we do the design thinking exercises in class, there's quite a bit of that back and forth. We do it in the form of one of two exercises um, in the class. And we have people either invent an actual product or we have people design a new experience. And it's that constant back and forth that's important. Now, the third aspect uh, or pillar of design thinking is the ideation. Once you think you understand the problem and how the person feels about that problem, then you can begin coming up with ideas. I think I have ways, or I think I have potential solutions. And the key thing when you're ideating is not to self edit, is to come up with absolutely as many ideas as possible, generate as many possibilities uh, there could because it's so much easier to whittle down possibilities than it is to constantly generate more. Plus, if you're self editing, you're doing you're cutting yourself short of what can possibly be because it's very possible that the one thing you're trying to get rid of or you're editing too early is probably the most innovative thing and the most important thing that will eventually be created. Um, so we teach people how to generate as many possibilities. And just when, when you think you can't generate another possibility, we ask you to generate more. And there are uh, tricks you can do to do that. Now, prototyping. This is so important because we build to think, and then the last step is we test to learn. So it's this combination of, of building and learning. And we feel like in a lot of ways, we've lost a whole generation of builders. During the whole uh, industrialization of the world, it was all about building, building skyscrapers and architecting things. And now sometimes when we get so enamored with software and other kinds of technologies, we don't inhabit the world of building as much, particularly building with our hands. We build with our minds, which is certainly very, very important, but there's still so much wonderful uh, value to be created in the world by building with our hands, by creating new things. And so don't be afraid to kind of create these new artifacts and design thinking can help you do that. One of the exercises uh, that's part of the introduction to design thinking and the ME310 class at Stanford, which is for engineers, is within this innovation lab, the very first exercise that the students have to undertake as a collective is they have to build a bicycle, but they build it out of cardboard including cardboard tools and cardboard panels. And not only do they have to build a bicycle, but they then have to race these bicycles because it's only in the building of it and then the testing of it that you really learn. So someone will get on the bike and they'll begin pedaling and one of the pedals will come off. Or for some reason, it's too hard. They did something wrong where it wasn't as easy to pedal. Or they'll feel that they put the uh, seat too close to the front wheel and they won't have enough room to get enough leverage to test the bicycle. That is all absolutely critical because sometimes the things that don't work are the most important knowledge that creates you what will work in the future. So all of these mistakes, it's not about not making mistakes, but it's about learning from mistakes that, that unintended outcomes are an inevitability of experimentation and new thought. But turning those unintended outcomes and what we uh, pejoratively called mistakes, when we, took, when we take away the stigma of those and turn those into knowledge, then that knowledge begins 
regenerating the flywheel of innovation. And so as Edison said, it's not that I've had failures, I've just learned 10,000 ways of not doing something, which is another apocryphal quote. So testing is an opportunity to learn about your solution and your user. And then of course, we go back through the cycle. And in our class, you will actually get a chance to experiment with this uh, over and over again. So in reality, this is actually what it looks like. A bowl of spaghetti in the beginning as you're doing this stuff, a lot of noise, the signal to noise ratio is gonna to be totally out of whack. And then as you begin prototyping and having conversations and handing prototypes and fixing prototypes and iterating prototypes and pushing them out there, things will begin uh, becoming clearer and clear. And this process, rather than looking like most people would think as this kind of linear or either exponential curve up and to the right, it actually looks like a corkscrew or what they call a pig's tail, where you go out and you get a little bit out ahead of your skis and you come back and you learn and you put that back out and you do that. And it's that process over and over again. So that's another place where the person who asked the question about comfort and safety, where as we push beyond our comfort zones, the new knowledge then gets brought back. It's like going out into space and bringing that knowledge from space back to earth and then applying it and then going back out and getting more. And just like we pedal that bike, the same thing is true of innovation. Now, I put this in because this is a, uh, a typical navigation of what do we know, both what we know as individuals and what are known by others. And it explores the different kind of uh, places of innovation. Um, uh, when we have things that are known by us and known by others, there's an open and free space. We can do whatever we want there. But if there's something unknown by me, but it's actually known by others, then I can go out and learn from other people. I can upgrade my own, which is one of the reasons you come to classes like this or come to lectures like this, because it's an exchange of knowledge where we all go away with more than we came with. And we can help fill in some of the blind spots that you may have in this. And that then gives you a chance to explore. And then of course we have the things that may be known by us, but unknown by others. In which case there's hidden areas to others. And that's why we teach and put this knowledge out in the world. One of the reasons that I came back to UCSD and agreed to be the director of design innovation was to help share a lot of these constructs with others and to make it so the campus as a culture collectively could be less afraid of the innovation and entrepreneurial process. Historically, when people present us with new ways of doing things, we tend to be very afraid of them because they ask us to change uh, what we're currently doing. And uh, innovation is almost like a virus and we want people to be inoculated with it, but, not to the, but to the point where there's an empathy for the entrepreneurial process to understand this uncertainty and ambiguity and a bit of anarchy and chaos that goes with this it's just what happens with entrepreneurs. So rather than be afraid of it, empathize with it and learn how to lean into it. And then of course, the final thing, which is things that are unknown by us and unknown by others, um, they're places of exploration. They're things to kind of do and shared new journeys uh, we can do. So one of the distillations of design thinking looks like this. It's, we say feasibility, viability, and desirability, where they all kind of come together. Another way of saying that is, the feasibility is, can we build it? Uh, the viability is, should we build it? And the desirability is, does anyone care if we build it? And each one of those steps is a very, very different uh, journey. And when they all come collectively together, that's where not only successful design, but successful opportunities live. And so this is another way of saying that in a business context. You bring a great idea to the table. Uh, we can then turn that idea into something, that artifact that people can work with, which will eventually be potentially a product. And then there's a great business model because as we as investors and as the market, innovation can only really be validated once it's imitated and used and diffused. Um, just because we invent something, that does not make it innovative. So again, the market and society has to judge this stuff and it does it, which is why these business models are so important because there has to be a value capture associated with the value creation. 
and it's the difference between those two that creates a good business opportunity. Now, I also recognize that not everyone who is an entrepreneur is interested in creating a business opportunity in air quotes. Some people want to create social benefit uh, opportunities or nonprofits or things that just change the world in a more positive way. And that's perfectly adequate. And we actually deal with those in our Essentials of Entrepreneurship and Innovation class. In fact, we have a whole session just on social innovation uh, by itself. So it's not completely uh, just assigned to businesses and commercial type enterprises. And of course, the innovation matrix is really where there are these four types of innovation that comes with based on not only how you define the problem, whether it's well-defined or ill-defined, and the domain, the space you're going into. The space, if you were looking at 2008, nine, and you were looking at the concepts of ride sharing, it was a not very well-defined space um, as a domain. And even the problem, but the problem was relatively well-defined and that's where the breakthrough innovation came. What was well-defined, and if you were ever to uh, see Travis and Ryan's presentation on Uber when they first started, it never actually started off as a ride-sharing company. It actually started off as a black car service, the equivalent of limousines that were for hire uh, uh, cars or what they called livery. And the vast majority of these, um, uh, mass majority of these limousines and black cars were underutilized. They were only used maybe 10 to 20% of the time. So Ryan and, and Travis saw an opportunity that, wow, if you have an asset that's only being used 10 to 20% of the time, then that other 80% of the time, there's an opportunity there. And that's when they decided that Uber could be. Now, eventually Uber transitioned and pivoted, as we will learn, into another business. And in the week during the Essentials of Entrepreneurship class that we touch on uh, presentations and business models, we actually completely deconstruct some of these businesses on exactly this kind of innovation matrix. Where did they sit and how did they evolve? So not everything has to be this disruptive and, and breakthrough innovation. Sometimes it's enough just to create either sustaining innovation or incremental innovation, or just things that are improvements to something that currently exists. So when we talk about entrepreneurship, not everything has to be this kind of radical uh, disruptive innovation or transformative innovation. Um, these are the kinds of organizations that you generally have to create or that we do create, whether it's at UCSD in the form of our makers labs and our incubators, or whether it's outside in the community, the programs like Connect and Evo Nexus. Uh, we find that innovation requires a whole ecosystem to support it. It requires a lot of different kinds of players uh, um, in the mix. And these are just some of the mechanisms by which uh, we support innovation at all stages. Now, the reason I show this, and sometimes we don't show this in a lot of our practices, this is quite an advanced um, a concept of what's, uh, uh, this framework is called the Kenevan framework. But to simplify dramatically to you, it just says that all problems that you may want to serve or uh, solve as an entrepreneur exists in one of four of these realms or domains. And the lower right-hand corner is the stuff that we all tend to know quite well, which is where best practice live. And it's where problems are quite obvious and the solutions to those uh, problems are obvious. It's where there's a high convergence of opinion and perspectives on this stuff. So th there's a cause and effect relationship that if we do X, Y should happen. Um, and so that's one type of problem that a lot of entrepreneurs go for. Now, the next one up in the upper right-hand corner on your screen is what we call complicated problems. That's where we bring a lot of things like physics and math and statistics to. It says that there are a set of governing constraints between where you're at and where you want to go. And it's governed by good practice where we can do analysis and we can say, and we can create models of probability and predictability, that if we're able to affect A, then we can, we're likely to be able to cause B. And so we create spreadsheets and models and statistical things that we can then approach it. And that's where a larger number of problems are solved. That's where a lot of venture capital historically goes um, because there's a really kind of tight constraints. And once we believe in that cause and effect relationship, uh, that we can invest in it. Now, the next layer over in the upper left is the space that I love to play. 
It's the area of complexity. It's also the place of emergence. And what emergence means, it's like early on. So this is where Uber uh, was years ago. It's where uh, Facebook was when it first started because there was nothing quite like it before. And so in some ways they were defining new spaces. And so it's not as if we can pull out all these models that say, oh, we've seen this before. Therefore, if we do X, then Y is likely to happen. All we do is have a set of hunches and we use a lot of intuition and heuristics to create the models. So instead of the models like we just talked about that are all about probability and predictability, these models are all about possibility and, and plausibility. Does it sound right? Do we think it's possible that can, it can be? And venture capitalists, um, the better venture capitalists reserve a portion of their portfolio for these. They sometimes call them high flyers, but those are the things that they're saying, hmm, it's kind of interesting, but if it works, this could be really, really big. And of course, the bottom left are usually unique practices, one-offs, black swans, all these things that uh, we can. It's also where chaos kind of lives. And so as we look at problems as a VC or as an investor and as you and an entrepreneur, try to think, where do I sit within this framework? Uh, this just really talks about that historically we thought we wanted people to build very strong, what we call robust models. Now, if you don't give any thought to your business you're gonna start, there's a good chance you're gonna build what's called a fragile model that you're gonna start something and the, someone's gonna challenge it, something you didn't think about and the model is just gonna break. You're gonna have to scrap it and start over again. Uh, slightly better than that are these robust models that it, when someone tries to break it, you're saying, oh, I'm just going to strengthen it. I'm just going to make it stronger. So it's going to be harder to break, but it's still eventually it will break. Someone will be able to hack it. Someone will be able to find something better, but eventually it will break. The next level up is where you hear most people talking about this resilience model that as people try to uh, create it or do break it, somehow we adapt to it. In other words, we fix it before anyone can. We strengthen it and we're constantly trying to stay one step ahead of where everyone's going. And that's called the resilience model that as people challenge it, we learn. But the ultimate business you want to build is the anti-fragile model. It doesn't survive in spite uh, of all the challenges. It survives precisely because of all the challenges. And this is precisely where, let's say, the typical software models have. People realize early on that we can't build perfect software, that eventually you have to create software put it out into the wild and the consumers will tell you what's right or wrong about um, your software. And so as you begin doing this, we test it, we try to break it. And as we break it, the system becomes a lot stronger, which is why you have version 1.0 and version 2.0 and version 3.0 of your software. So same thing has to be thought of your businesses and your business model, which is then why we come into this concept of business model generation. In the second class, of the essentials of entrepreneurship, we take all of these concepts and we, as we said, we let you play and explore and experiment with design thinking on how you organize your thoughts and get your thoughts into some kind of shape in your head. But at some point you have to take what's in your head and commit it to paper. And that's where a business model comes um, forward. And it's different uh, because a business model is a way of testing a lot of the hypotheses and opinions and conjectures and anecdotes and observations you have, um, but about how you're going to deliver value and capture that value back from the world. And it's different um, than a business plan um, because it will not only allow us to organize our thoughts, but uh, it will allow us to organize these things in a very visual uh, form. Now, this talks about why we do business modeling versus business planning. Business plans were fine before where they're, again, in that box I showed you where we have a lot of known knowns, where you have a lot of certainty and, and uh, convergence of opinion around something, business plans can work quite well. So you can write a business plan for a therapeutic development company because it's more of a linear traditional practice. But if you have a lot of unknowns, then business plans work because they're more dynamic. They allow you to rewrite them over and over again, almost like software. Uh, the second bullet point is that, you know, what we've found as investors is no bad business plan will ever survive contact with the customer. You take a business plan into the market and the minute the customer challenges it, it breaks down because something you didn't think about or some assumption you made, which was wrong, will force you to rethink it. Mike Tyson always said, you always have a plan until you're punched in the face. 
Um, plus, before you have a product or a sales, you have to develop a series of hypotheses and way to test them. So Steve Blank says a startup company is merely a temporary organization searching for that repeatable, scalable business model. And then our assumptions are more relevant to the potential investors than a spreadsheet with financial models. Because I will tell you that there's never been a financial model that I've seen that has been correct. But that's fine because everyone's got those hockey sticks where our, our, our revenue increases, our margins increase, our profitability increases, but that's fine. What's more important are the assumptions you have under that. So when you present to us, I'm gonna ask you more about how did you think about this number? Where does that number come from? And how you thought about that answer is far more important than what you put down on paper. And of course, we allows you to remodel. So this is really what the business model will look like. This is what we will take you through. We're not gonna ex uh, explore it too much today. Is, but it says there's various elements of your business that you do that relate to one another. And we're going to show you exactly how one part of what you need in your business relates to all the other parts of your business. And not only is this a good way of thinking and deconstructing what your business idea will be as you go forward, but as investors, we use this exact same tool to deconstruct your business. So when you come to investment for us, we're going to ask you specifically about these various parts of your business, how you thought about them, how you've tested them, what you learned, what was validated, what was invalidated. Because ultimately, everything you know about your company is a small number of facts and a lot of opinions, a lot of conjectures, a lot of hypotheses, anecdotes. And we're so used to very strong entrepreneurial or business leaders stating everything as if it's an actual fact. And we listen to that and we go, wow, they're very confident. But ultimately, we know because we've done enough of these businesses that the vast majority of what you're telling us is your opinion or your hypothesis. And so because of those, we're going to then ask you, so tell me about how you intend to validate or invalidate or prove what you're telling me. Because until you have customers uh, continually, until you have revenue continually, until you have profits continuously, then a lot of these things still have to be proven. And that's what we help people to do. And so really what you've got are a series of guesses. And we're going to ask you to do that. And the only way you can validate or invalidate any of those guesses is to then get out of the building, get out of your chairs, and go out into the world, talk to potential customers, talk to supply chain partners, talk to people who are going to work with you, because that's where all the magic happens, not in the room. And then that's where you're able to bring back all this wonderful knowledge that you've then learned. But even that isn't the end of the journey. It's just one road along the journey. Now, the reason Alex and Eve created this business model canvas tool, uh, Alex created actually as, as part of his PhD thesis. And he realized that, you know, although our brains are not truly like completely left and right brain as much as we like to, there is something about this concept that Part of us is logical, part of us is emotional, and we relate the two. So is the business model canvas, because the left hand is about how do we create the efficiencies in the business we're going to create. The right side is all about how do we create the value in the company we wish to build. And it's built along this concept of what's called blue ocean strategy, where ultimately where the innovation lives is where the value we create and the costs we're able to manage come together and therein lies an opportunity. So that's kind of the journey. Uh, people have been so enamored with this business model canvas that what's happened is that it's, it's, it's inspired many kinds of imitations and iterations of the business. And Alex and Eve embrace that. In fact, in my work with ecosystems, we created an ecosystem canvas. So they've encouraged this concept of the deconstruction. And by the way, the reason it's called a canvas is just like an artist canvas. You start off with something that's blank and then you paint upon it, you create upon it. This is exactly the same thing. Now the lean canvas is meant as a precursor to the business model canvas. And in the lean canvas, you don't have to do quite as much work. You can, you can start with some very initial uh, blocks. And so for those of you who are merely starting on your journey, this lean canvas will probably be a more appropriate tool to start the journey. Um, and not only that, when you create a company, it does not stand alone on its own in a vacuum. Eventually your business model 
just like an airplane. You could build the most perfect airplane, but eventually when you launch that airplane into the sky, it will be subjected to forces of nature. Thrust, lift, drag, and as will your business. You will put your business out into the wild, out into the market, out in society, and there will be a set of uh, forces that will act upon it. But now that you know or can visualize or imagine what these forces are, then you can so deconstruct and understand them. So again, on this business journey, you can see how we take a lot of the uncertainty and ambiguity away by helping you ask the right questions and explore the right areas and then deconstruct them. And once you do, you can then create or at least test more and more of your hypotheses. And now I'm just going to show you very quickly that some of these other forms of canvases. This one was created uh, by some colleagues of mine who say it's not enough for you to create just a business that you have to be mindful of the environment. More of a kind of, it's why, it's just why it's called the flourishing canvas, that all of our actions have an impact, not just on an economy and customers, but on a society and on the environment. So even when we want to create an electric car and we want to put lithium batteries in it, Though the, there is a environmental cost to the mining of that lithium, which then goes in our batteries, and we can take a more holistic approach to the companies we create. Uh, this is that rainforest canvas that I told you about, which is an ecosystem canvas, which is how do we build communities? How do we build governments? And that's a different way of deconstruction. This is another form of a business canvas uh, that someone created that takes into account some of the, uh, that focuses more on a subset of the business model. This is a social model. If you want to create something that is more socially relevant and is not about pure profit, you can create something like this or a mission model canvas, which we'll show you. This is a canvas that just purely focuses on the value proposition of what you're going to do. Um, the, this is the, that mission model where it's not about, and this kind of came to light when people realized uh, when they were doing this form of work for the US military, that the military didn't care about how profitable you know, your solution was, how well it managed to uh, uh, constrain costs. They just wanted to know, did it solve the problem and did it do it at the scale that the military needed it? So this is wonderful when you're applying for something that's trying to meet a very specific mission or outcome and the other things like prices and costs are less relevant. Uh, this is one specifically around brand strategy. Uh, and we'll make these all available to you, as you'll be able to see. This is one around an innovator's canvas, which is when you're thinking even earlier than the lean canvas, it allows you to uh, uh, begin analyzing things. This is around when you want to build your team. Can you deconstruct your team? Um, so you can see over and over again that there's all these variations and flavors of various canvases that you can uh, play with. This is a project canvas. This is a product canvas. Uh, so ultimately, what we say is the reason you have to believe in yourself uh, for this stuff is because everything you need to become the greatest entrepreneur or even someone who no, doesn't necessarily see themselves as an entrepreneur but may want to work in an entrepreneurial type organization is just about going on the journey and going uh, with others and exploring this stuff. So at this point, I will thank you and thank you for listening to this very brief, fast introduction and exploration of the space. And if we have time, Nathan, I'm certainly happy to take uh, uh, some questions uh, from the audience. Sure, so if, if people do have questions, go ahead and throw them in chat and I will relay them on to uh, Greg. But Greg, real quick, you kind of touched on it at the end there. Uh, you know, for those who are not necessarily thinking about a starting a business, uh, how are these tools or concepts applicable to them if they're working within an organization already? Well, that's an excellent question. Because when we design our class, we designed it for three very specific groups. One are for people who think that they might be entrepreneurs at the beginning of a journey and want to learn a little bit more what it means to start, grow, create a company, a product, a service, something like that. The second group were people who say, mm, I'm not necessarily, I don't see myself as the, the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world, but I do see myself as someone who might want to work for an interesting dynamic company. And so what is it like to work inside of a dynamic company where information and roles are constantly changing and where one moment I'm the leader of X and the next moment I'm part of a team 
uh, that where I'm not the leader. The third group are for people who say, I work inside of an institutional organization. It may be something large like a university or a large company, or it may be, a, let's say, a, a government. And they want to say, how do I bring more entrepreneurial and innovative thinking to these people? How do I take these constructs that you're talking about and teach them and propagate these things inside of our organizations? So this class is relevant to all of them. And some of the feedback we've been hearing from everybody in the class is they said, we didn't realize that what we learned in this class was more of a life skill than merely an enterprise skill. We went in thinking we were just gonna learn some business skills. And people say that everything you've taught are things we've used in every other aspect of our life, which is our family relationships, or how do I deal with the uncertainty of COVID and what's going on in the world? So that's where it's really helpful. Excellent, thanks. Uh, there was a question, you mentioned a book earlier. What, which book was that? I have usually mentioned several books, so I'm not really sure. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if it was maybe business model generation or- It could be that one. The other book that was really helpful in what I read was called The Knowing Doing Gap. Uh, I also mentioned Matt Ridley's book called The Rational Optimist um, that talks about the bio- so we're biologically hardwired for innovation. It's not just something we do because we're bored or because we just are um, have ADHD like I do. Um, it's because we're biologically wired to, to evolve. And on one of my slide decks that I do, I have my last slide normally says, without order, nothing can exist. But without chaos, nothing can evolve. And really, the systems isn't one or the other. It's how do we kind of cre create this right uh, pulse between the innovators who push and try to change the status quo and the system that pushes back against them saying, we don't need this. And there's a famous quote from Buckminster Fuller says that you will never appropriately change things by fighting the existing realities. The way you change things is by creating new models or new opportunities, which will eventually make the old products or opportunities obsolete. And so you almost transcend it. And there will, by the way, for those of you who think you're entrepreneurs, there will always be a natural cascade to your journey. There's a saying, it was originally uh, from Nicholas Klein, although people have attributed it to Gandhi and other people that say, you know, first they ignore you, then they ridicule you, then they attack you, and then eventually they build monuments to you. And then other iterations of it say, and then they will take what you're doing or saying as completely self-evident, which is why have you seen these innovators journeys like with ride sharing or search? We say, well, of course, we can't imagine now living without these things. But at the time they were presented, nobody wanted them. Nobody thought that they were necessary. In the late seventies, early eighties, if you walked down a street and said, how many of you would like a micro computer or a personal computer? People would say, what's that and why do I need that? So it's this kind of natural journey of innovation where these people don't necessarily need permission from others to do this stuff. And they, they're not using status as a calibration mechanism. Like what do other people think of me? They change things because of their intellectual curiosity and because there's a deep belief inside themselves that they can actually change the world. And they also possess, which what we do in some of our classes is they possess what we call productive paranoia. This balance of a paradox between truly optimism, true optimism, believing they can change the world, and this feeling of skepticism that they know someone's trying to stop them from doing that. And that balances what we as investors call productive paranoia. All right, we've got a few more questions here. Hopefully we can squeeze them in before uh, we, okay. we hit the end of it. Uh, one question, if I'm looking to make a new product, do you recommend any resources to get started with an actual prototype? And I'm assuming they mean a tangible object versus a concept or a service or a process. And happy to take that offline, but also the great thing about UCSD and you can contact either through extension or through the Office of Innovation uh, through our contact information. The wonderful thing about that is we have a number of what are called makers spaces, which allow you to make and build prototypes. And these are tinkering labs where you can just kind of experiment. Plus there's a number of incubators on campus and resources they can point you to. The wonderful thing about innovation is there's a lot of redundancy. So there's not, there's multiple ways. I also see another question that says, 
Uh, it's, it's, See, oh, I think the second one says kind of the same thing. If an innovator would like to go through the process you described, where would you go to find people or consultants to help them? Again, through the Office of Innovation, where we act as a concierge and a facilitator of relationship, you can also go through extension, um, but there's lots of resources available to uh, us uh, and the community. There's other ones in the community as well, and we can create a map for you. Um, another question was right now I'm starting uh, a business in the fashion industry and all the pieces are handmade and of course I want to make some money, but also I think put a higher price. Uh, but also I think put a higher price it remove it remove of the list customers I don't understand. Uh, I think if, if she goes for a higher price then that will price out some of her customers, possibly. Yeah, so in the business model canvas we actually look at that and you move between what we call commoditized innovation and a niche or specialized innovation um, where exactly that's what you do when you move along the spectrum the hot more specialty you go you remove a lot of people from it because not only the price point but the access to it it's what um like uh, kanye west did with yeezys he made a conscious choice to say i don't want to be part of the commodity uh, uh luxury sneaker market i'm going to uh, restrict the amounts and charge a higher price point understanding that fewer people will get to it but i'll also be able to push on the supply demand part of the curve and create demand that way. And that's been a very successful. So uh, in fashion, that's used all the time uh, for it, which is why um, Gucci are, is not clothing. Prada is not clothing. It's more of a statement. Uh, and when people buy it, they buy it for very different reasons than just mere utility of, of dressing ourselves. All right, well, we're just about done here. Uh, one thing I do want to mention the question about finding resources, people, consultants to help them. Uh, the webinar we did right before this, actually we had several people who are mentors for an or organization called SCORE. So if you're not based in San Diego here and, and are not able to access some of the resources here at UCSD, the Small Business Administration helps support a lot of these chapters throughout the country where there are experienced people who mentor on a free basis, uh, people who have ideas. So uh, if you check out our YouTube channel, and I'll send a link out to that to everybody who attended in an email, uh, you can go back and watch that webinar and the people there will tell you more about your local SCORE chapter. Uh, all right, well, with that, I want to thank everybody for attending today. Had some really good turnout uh, and some really good questions here at the end. Greg, thank you very much for covering a, a lot of very important, valuable information uh, today. So I appreciate that. Which is and why it's that, wonderful. You can go back and watch it at your leisure. That's the way most useful knowledge is. It's uh, you hear it once and you may hear to hear it uh, several times. So please come back and, and, and listen. And I'll get an email out later today with a copy of the slide deck that everybody attended. So you can refer to a lot of the information Greg had there as well. And I All want right. to thanks to Gwen too. Yeah. You didn't see her behind the scenes, but I can't do anything I do at UCSD without Gwen. Yes, as always. Thank you, Gwen. Okay, everybody, thanks for attending. Uh, hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.